Thank you again to all of you for joining us here this afternoon. We have two more items on our agenda. So first we're going to hear a presentation uh, from Amy Finkelstein, which I'll introduce in a minute. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion following that with uh, a number of our affiliates and one of our key partners to describe some of the work that we have ongoing. So we're so thrilled to have you here. Um, I'd also like to extend another welcome to the people from Ariadna Labs who are joining us this afternoon um, as a part of their research meeting. Um, so thank you so much for reconvening. Um, next, we're going to hear from Amy Finkelstein. She is the John and Jenny S. McDonald Professor of Economics here at MIT. Um, and I, I won't embarrass her by listing the many awards that she has received, but suffice it to say that we feel extremely fortunate at JPL North America to have her as one of our co-scientific directors for the center. Um, and I've learned so much from her over the past three years as we've launched the North America office, and in, including the healthcare delivery initiative that we're celebrating here today. Um, so we're extremely excited to, to have her here. And she's going to be speaking about uh, randomized evaluations, what we're doing with this initiative, and some examples of ongoing work that we have. So please help me welcome Amy to the stage. Thank you, Marianne, very much. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I think, uh, you know, we had a conference two years ago at the launch of this initiative. I, I'm not sure if the title of my talk has changed. Uh, for those of you who were here two years ago, the first third uh, may sound familiar, but what I'm incredibly excited about is how different the last two thirds look from where we were two years ago, and, and I'm sure it would look uh, even different uh, uh, two years hence. So in some sense, this talk is a, is a bit of a journey. Um, I want to start by talking about the value of randomization. We've heard a bit about that today, and I'm going to talk about it more just through a, my own personal experience, how I came to this. I'm, I'm an economist. Uh, I study health economics. I, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm not many things that many of you in the room are. And, you know, there, you have, we have physicians in the room. We have uh, implementing partners who actually tr work to improve the delivery of the healthcare system. I just try to study those things. And so I use lots of different methods in my work, uh, quasi-experimental, economic modeling, uh, and sort of how I came to see, in some cases, how the value of a randomized evaluation can really be transformative. And you know, that's, as, as Dr. Jaw talked about this, earlier today, there's a pessimistic and, and depressing part of the talk and a more optimistic. So the, the pessimistic part is, is the second bullet, which is what I talked about two years ago, which is, now that I saw the wonderful, uh, incredible power of randomized evaluations to provide compelling evidence on things that were being debated largely by ideology and opinion, why was it so rare? Where are they? And what did we think we could do about it? And I stood up two years ago somewhat confidently or overconfidently, and based on a, you know, some of the thinking we had been doing at JPAL said, here's why I think we're poised for change. <laughs> and luckily uh, for me, the, the, the network of JPAL affiliates and staff and the partners that they've reached out and engaged with actually made my totally optimistic and non-evidence-based uh, prediction uh, come true. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about some of the amazing progress that we've seen even just in these two years. And then, of course, um, where, where we hope to go uh, to, to make whatever grandiose predictions I make now, you guys can make them come true uh, two years from now. All right, so, so to start with the value of randomization, I, I wanted to give a little example from uh, some of my own work. Uh, these are um, headlines or from various newspaper articles uh, about uh, the debate over Medicaid. These are actually several years old, but you could find the same things today. And you know, what you have on, on uh, your left, or perhaps uh, you, know, you can say whether it's on the political left or not, is claims of like the just amazing transformative power of Medicaid uh, and the, actually, that Medicaid is a panacea. It's not a hard choice. We can uh, expand Medicaid and save money, so we can uh, do well and do good at the same time. And this, you know, sort of, there's a lot of discussion in the policy world about how um, expanding health insurance like Medicaid to low-income people will actually save money by improving their health so that they don't need as much care, or uh, what you hear a lot about is getting the uninsured out of the expensive emergency room and into much more efficient and lower-cost primary care. So that's you know the, on one side of the debate. And on the other side, you hear really apoplectic, uh, sorry, apolic, ap ap that word, uh, <laughs> stories 
Um, you know, that Medicaid, the Wall Street Journal says that Medicaid is worse than no coverage at all, or other uh, outlets call it a humanitarian catastrophe. And here they point to the fact that uh, provider reimbursements for Medicaid are very low. And there are many, many stories about how people can't get in to see their doctor. There was a story I saw on CNN in which a woman said, my Medicaid card is a useless piece of plastic because, you know, I'm sick and no doctor will see me for the surgery I need. So, so, so what do you do with this type of rhetoric? Uh, well, uh, Kate Baker, who's here with me, and I got extremely lucky in that the state of Oregon in 2008 uh, chose to run a lottery uh, for, uh, to expand Medicaid to certain low-income individuals and not others. Um, we found out about this because uh, Stephen Colbert did a spoof on it on his comedy show in which you know, these crazy people, you know, scratch and sniff, did I win a kidney? Right? You know, we saw nothing funny about it at all. We are incredibly serious, high-minded academics, and we saw only a research opportunity. <laughs> And a little bit of humor. Um, so a little more seriously, basically, the state of Oregon, like many states, has both a general Medicaid program that covers people who are both financially and categorically eligible for Medicaid. So financially means they have to be poor. And the categories are things like you need to be a child or a pregnant woman or disabled or something, or meet a certain category. And then they have, as many states do, an expansion program to cover people who are financially eligible for Medicaid, but not categorically eligible. So in essence, low-income adults. They may have children. They don't have to be childless, but they are not themselves children. Uh, and this, is, you know, this was in 2008. Uh, this program had been closed to uh, new beneficiaries for a number of years because of budget pressures. And at the, but, but of course, you, know, there, you constantly have to recertify your eligibility, and, and income is volatile in a low-income population. So people were gradually attriting from the rolls because it was closed. There was only one direction of flow. And so the, the number of people on the rolls were, were shrinking. And at the start of 2008, the state realized that they had enough money to, to cover an additional uh, number of people. But they also realized correctly that if they, if they simply opened up the, pop, the, the pool to anyone, there were many more people than would be, that were eligible for this program than they had the money to cover. They, they had about the money to cover about 10,000 people. And we've since estimated that there were about probably 200,000 people in Oregon who met these requirements. Uh, so what did they do? Uh, without any research or input, as I said, we found out about this thanks to Dr. Colbert. Um, but they, they got together with, with stakeholders and community leaders, and they decided that the fairest thing to do to allocate a, a scarce number of limited slots was to hold a lottery. They thought that, in particular, the other main thing they considered was first come, first serve. And there was a lot of concern that that would privilege whoever had their act together and happened to know about it. And those might not be the people who were most in need or would most benefit from the program. So in January and February 2008, they ran a big public relations campaign. They took out ads on buses in community health centers. And they said, if you're interested, sign up. And then they, they randomly selected names each, each month from a list starting in March until they had enrolled enough people. So as I said, you know, we saw this as a, just an unprecedented opportunity to bring uh, the rigors of you know, a randomized evaluation, what is uh, legitimately and rightfully the gold standard of medical and scientific research to what is arguably one of the most pressing public policy questions of the day, uh, you know, the expansion of Medicaid. I will say that while we were uh, going on and starting this, so as I said, the program started in 2008. We were raising funds to do some of the work in 2009, and we got well, we're about to have a Medicaid expansion to cover everyone. Isn't this question obsolete? It turns out no question ever becomes uh, obsolete in US uh, healthcare. Um, so you know, Kate and I really thought that this was a, an invaluable opportunity. And we collected a wealth of data ranging in both their uh, financial cost and their ease of use. So that by far the cheapest and sort of highest quality data was the administrative data we got, uh, hospital discharge records, emergency room views, uh, excuse me, emergency room visits, credit reports, earnings data from the Social Security Administration. This has the value of being incredibly comprehensive. It's incredibly inexpensive because it was collected anyway. And you can get really, really detailed, right? You can know the precise diagnoses and procedures done, et cetera. It has one important disadvantage, which is if it's not collected in the administrative data, you can't measure it. And so we were interested in many other things that you can't see in these administrative data, other types of healthcare use, like physician visits or prescription drugs, uh, self-reported health and well-being, financial strain, and even uh, physical health measures, you know, clinical measures of blood pressure, et cetera. So we sort of, you know, did, did sort of went for all three to try to uh, cover our bases. Um, so let me, you know, there's a, there's a large sort of wealth of 
uh, findings that have come out of this study. This was a, like, like sort of every randomized evaluation that J-PAL affiliates conduct. This was a, you know, cooperative effort between not only uh, Kate and myself and other academic researchers, but partners in the state and partners in the healthcare provider community in Oregon, who we work together, uh, both in terms of what questions to ask and how to ask them and on the literal implementation. Um, but sort of one question that comes up is how does uh, insurance affect emergency room use? And so we did something that, you know, I'm sure some of my economist colleagues would be appalled by, which is we actually talked to some of the people in our study, uh, as well as uh, measuring the, you met, you're taking lots of measures of them. Uh, we didn't, of course. I, I'm not trained to talk to people who aren't economists, but um, <laughs> our trained uh, focus group people did. Uh, and so I just want to, and this goes back to the point I made at the beginning about the sort of wars of anecdotes that you can see in the, in the, in the, in the media. These are two quotes from real people in our study talking about their actual real experiences. So one of them said, when I was uninsured, unless something happened where I had to go to the hospital, then I'd just go to the emergency room and deal with it. Emergency rooms, from what I understand, they can never turn you away. So this is someone who, who speaks to that you know, idea I put up at the beginning, that the uninsured go to the emergency room, and if you give them formal insurance, they'll go to the emergency room less. On the other hand, we had another person who said, without coverage, I wouldn't have gone to the emergency room those nights I was in crisis, because I was already in crisis, and the idea of the bills I would have had just would have been too much for me to take take on mentally or financially. So this is someone who's saying, no, uh, the, emergence, the insurance is not going to get me to go to the, uh, uh, to, uh, sorry, without insurance, I won't go to the emergency room. With insurance, I actually will go to the emergency room because I'll no longer be worried about those bills. So it's the exact opposite. I won't go to the emergency room. I'll go to the emergency room if I don't have insurance, or I'll go to the emergency room with insurance. So, so and these are both plausible, and, and I won't bore you with the, the economic details, but, but you know, when I teach this in my class, they're, they're sort of simple economic models to explain both of these. So these are very credible hypotheses, and when you know, pe what people say differs and when economic theory is inconclusive, uh, you really need evidence. And here's the evidence. This is from a paper we, we published in, in Science in 2014. Uh, what I've shown in the dark blue is the average number of either the chance of going to the emergency room or the number of emergency room visits over an 18-month period for the controls, the people who lost the lottery. And what I've shown in the orange is the, uh, the increased effect for those who won the lottery and got on Medicaid. And what you can see sort of focusing, say, on the number of emergency room visits is that on average uh, in, the, in the control group, uh, the low-income uninsured adults went to the emergency room once over an 18-month period. And in the treatment group, if they got covered by Medicaid and won the lottery, that went up to 1.4 visits, so a 40% increase in emergency room use. So what's the answer? The answer is that Medicaid increases emergency room use. And because many people we knew would be surprised by this result, although as I said, it makes sense from an economic perspective, uh, Medicaid makes the emergency room free. And you know, Economics 101 says you know, when things become cheaper, people buy more of it. And so when you make you know, emergency rooms free, people go to it more often, right? but we were surprised, as were other people, and so we, we dug more deeply, and this result, it's, it's one of the most sort of robust results I've ever seen in the sense that it holds in every subpopulation you look at in the data, people who'd used the emergency room a lot before the, the, the study, people who'd never gone to the emergency room, uh, on-hours care and off-hours care, uh, visits for things that look like real emergencies according to physician clinical definitions, vis visits for things that look like they are primary care treatable, they all went up. And actually, a, a paper we just had come out a couple weeks ago in the New England Journal says that if you sort of extend the data out to two years and break it up by time period, this is a persistent result. This wasn't a short run run up that then fell off. It, 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 the increase is immediate and persists over two years. And, and the reason I'm sort of emphasizing this among many of the results um, that, uh, that the study has found, and I'll describe a few more of them in a minute, is that, as I said, uh, this surprised many people. And I think that speaks directly to something that Dr. Gwande was talking about in his talk about you know, what is the value of a randomized evaluation. And some of the value, I think, comes from its incredible clarity and it's therefore its ability to surprise us. And I'll come back to that more in a moment. So just to briefly tell you some of the other findings that we had, there's a, a J-PAL policy brief that describes them in more detail. We found that Medicaid increases healthcare use across the board, so not just the emergency room that I talked about, but also hospital care, also primary care, preventive care. We found a 60% increase in mammograms for the population that was recommended to get them. Uh, prescription drugs. It also has a 
important benefits in terms of economic security. Again, something Dr. Gwande alluded to. It reduced out-of-pocket costs and financial strain. So it basically eliminated the chance that you had what the World Health Organization defines as catastrophic out-of-pocket medical expenses, which means having to pay more than 30% of your household income on medical bills. Uh, which, you know, if you think about insurance from, a, from an economic point of view, that's the primary purpose of insurance is to provide financial protection. It had no detectable effect on earnings and employment. There have been extreme claims on both dimensions that expanding Medicaid would either be the fiscal stimulus we desperately needed in 2008 or a job killer. We found a very precise zero. On health, the, the results were more mixed. Uh, we found improved self-reported health. We found reductions in depressions. Uh, we administered a depression screen, so a nine percentage point reduction in the probability of screening positive for depression, which is a 30% reduction in this, possible, in this population. And we found no detectable effects on the measures of physical health that we were able to look at in this population, such as blood pressure, sort of, and our confidence intervals on blood pressure could sort of rule out previous quasi-experimental uh, evidence on improvements in blood pressure. Okay, so there was a, a massive media response to this work. Um, and I put this up for, for several reasons. First, it makes my mom proud, um, so I have to mention that. Um, but, but for two other reasons. First of all, one of the reasons it makes my mom proud is because nothing I do gets into the uh, media. And that's, be and that's because, not because all my other work is terrible, although we can discuss that offline, but, <laughs> but because this really speaks to, this again, something Dr. Gawande mentioned, the incredible clarity of a randomized evaluation. Uh, and, and, it's, and so people, as you can judge from these headlines, and if you recognize the fonts or you can guess based on the you know, headlines what the political leanings are, people are finding all kinds of different things from this study. Everything from you know Oregon's you know uh, Oregon shows that people are better off to you know uh, I guess it's not up here but there's another one that says you know Oregon's lesson to the nation Medicaid works and there's another one that says Oregon's lesson to the nation Medicaid doesn't work right so they're arguing about what it means but no one's arguing about the findings they're, they're, they don't like some of them they like others they emphasize some more than others uh, but they don't but they're not arguing about it and that's unlike any other work that I've done where if people are surprised by the findings or don't like them they rightly question the methods. Maybe I didn't you know, control for that time trend in the kind of pre-post study we were talking about exactly right. Or maybe my control group, though I picked it well, I didn't pick it well enough. And so that's the ability to sort of surprise us and move the discourse forward is, is another reason I think it gets so much attention. And, and then the final thing I want to talk about is, and this sort of gets to the, the briefly pessimistic part, is there's a third reason that the study got so much attention, other than making my mother proud and the incredible power of randomized evaluations. And this one's a little sad. It's because it's all too rare, right? And that's kind of why we're here today, right? So, you know, Kate and I, we like to think we're, we're good researchers, but neither of us think this is rocket science. And it's kind of sad that it's so rare and it gets so much attention because it's so rare. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the updating from our findings, except to say that we sort of reject both the most uh, optimistic views of what Medicaid can do and, and the most pessimistic views of what it doesn't do. Um, and I sort of uh, want to move on to this question of why it's so rare, which is what sort of motivated me to help uh, for, found and work with JPAL North America uh, to change that. Um, so. Uh, why is it so rare, or where is it? This is um, one of our collaborators in the Oregon study, Sarah Taubman and I wrote a piece on science about this in which we, we verified what I just said, that in fact, Oregon gets so much attention in part because it's so rare. So we found, for example, that 80% of studies of US-based medical interventions are randomized, and that's true uh, also of non-drug studies. This isn't just because the FDA requires, requires it. Even two-thirds of non-drug interventions, medical interventions, are randomized. Less than 20% of, of interventions in healthcare delivery. And that's even lower than other uh, social policy uh, areas, like education. You have almost 40% being randomized and an international development uh, close to a half. So then we tried to talk to people. We talked to a lot of the partners we were working with or potential partners. Uh, we talked to uh, practitioners and we asked why. And we got several answers and, we have, and what I want to talk about is sort of how we have been thinking about this. So one issue that comes up a lot is, is the ethics of rationing, right? So clearly, and this I think again fits very well with what Dr. Gawande was saying, the, the, the more sort of 
common sense or theory or existing evidence we have that something is incredibly beneficial, and the, if we have the money to do it, we're not going to hold it back you know, just to test it. right? But there's often cases where there's clinical equipoise, where we have, as Dr. Jaw was saying earlier, faith but not evidence. right? Uh, or where we just don't have the resources to expand to everyone, as in the case of Oregon or in the case of you know, many of the partners we work with now. So the, the program is going to be rolled out gradually anyway. Uh, so why not just make it uh, systematically ad hoc rather than somewhat ad hoc? And that's the case with Dr. Brenner and the Camden Coalition, who we're working with now. They, despite all of their success and their high profile, uh, both from Dr. Gwandi's New Yorker article and from uh, Dr. Brenner winning a MacArthur Award, they don't have the resources to reach all of the individuals who are eligible for their intervention for these high-cost utilizers. And so they were only reaching about 50% of them anyway. And we just said, well, rather than make that ad hoc, we had a recruiter available today. They were busy tomorrow. Let's make it systematically ad hoc and actually embed in what was their ongoing program an ability to study it. Another thing that often comes up is that RCTs cost a lot of money or take a lot of time. And, and this is something I want to sort of uh, disabuse you of. So first of all, uh, in terms of time, RCTs need not and often do not add to the costs of prospective research. Obviously, if you want to look at existing data and do a retrospective study, you know, if it wasn't randomized, it would take more time to do that. But many interventions are now being rolled out now and studied prospectively. And if you're interested in a primary outcome that's, say, six-month readmission rates, I don't care how smart you are, you can't get that answer in less than six months. Right? Prospective work takes time, but it doesn't have to take any longer just because at the back end, uh, a computer is assigning you know, which patient a recruiter who has limited time anyway is supposed to approach. And in terms of costs, as I mentioned before, one of the things that drastically reduces costs and can often improve quality is to rather than have to do painstaking, costly, and time-intensive primary data collection where you go follow up the treatment and control patients and interview them and find out how they're doing, you can often just passively witness in real time their outcomes in administrative data, such as hospital readmissions, emergency room visits, uh, that sort of thing. And the final sort of challenge to uh, RCTs that's often brought up is, sure, that's fine if you want to study some patient-level intervention or maybe a physician-level intervention, but that doesn't work for system-wide interventions. And that's where a lot of the focus is today. Think to Dr. Jaw's talk uh, earlier today about bundled payments, right? And I had a slide you know, of sort of a rhetorical set of points on this from a couple years ago. I'm actually not going to discuss it because the proof is in the pudding, and I'm going to tell you in a few minutes about a system-wide RCT that I and j -Pal had nothing to do with that is underway that I'm incredibly excited about. OK, so this is where we were last time. I said there's a real possibility for a new era. Everyone has skin in the game. Uh, accountable care organizations should want to know what works. There's a lot of pressure on public budgets. You know, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of progress. And we all got together two years ago. We formed some partnerships and kind of crossed our fingers, right? There's been an amazing amount of progress. So as I said, this was our conference from two years ago at which uh, Peter Orzag spoke. Uh, we've had um, We've had an incredible amount of success building partnerships with policymakers and practitioners, many of whom are in the room and whom we've generously made themselves and their data systems and their interventions available for us to work with. We've had generous uh, support both from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I want to just give you a few examples of the types of studies we have done or have had uh, underway. Uh, and just to give you a range of the set of both questions that can be asked and the ways they can be asked and the partners we work with. So starting you know, with the federal government, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, and the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team partnered with us. Uh, the CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, was interested in combating uh, uh, suspected over-prescribing of high-risk controlled substances such as opioid, and they have a letter that they send out that says, you know, we've noticed that you may be an outlier prescriber, stop, or we'll say stop again. Um, and, uh, and they wanted to know if it was effective. They, they send similar letters in, in, to physicians who do a lot of other tests. And so we simply partnered with them. We randomized half. They identified their outliers. We randomized uh, half of them to get letters, half of them not. And we, they defined their outcome. Because a key part of what we do is work with the partner to find out what they consider not only the problem, but the definition of success. And they wanted to look at three month uh, prescribing rates. So we looked at that. And again, you know, we're not faster than three months. Uh, 
uh, so we had to wait three months to see what happened. But very quickly after that, because we had access to their administrative data, we were able to find uh, what happened and publish the results in Health Affairs, which is nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, you know, the most precise zero we've ever gotten. But to their credit, they wanted to know that answer, and they said, well, now what? And we said, well, gee, we don't know either, but there's a lot of people who are you know, trained in uh, behavioral sciences and psychology who have done a lot of things. Someone mentioned the, the energy studies where they send you letters repeatedly telling you how you're doing compared to your neighbors. So some of the JPAL affiliates are now partnering with um, CMS on second round letters, other designs drawing on insights from behavioral and social sciences to test other things. And you know, I'm not allowed to tell you those results yet, but suffice it to say, I feel that this is a real um, cooperative and uh, engaged partnership. I'm gonna have to go uh, a little more quickly, seeing the time, so let me just briefly mention, you heard from Wes Yin about uh, uh, experiments on health insurance exchanges. We have a number of those underway, not just in uh, California, but also in, in Colorado. Uh, you've heard some talk about the, the Camden Coalition and our partnership there with Dr. Brenner on his post-discharge intervention of these super utilizers of the healthcare system. That's a patient level intervention. We're also uh, launching within the next uh, few weeks a provider level intervention in partnership with Aurora Healthcare to study the impact of clinical decision support that turns on for, patient, for providers to warn them if they're ordering a scan that's considered inappropriate. So you know, that's an example of a provider level intervention. Uh, workness well place, wor workplace wellness programs were also mentioned uh, in Catherine Hempstead's remark and, remarks, and that's another thing where we're doing a randomized evaluation. So these are just a few of the examples. The final thing I want to mention is one that has not, I found out about this a few weeks ago. As far as I, certainly I had nothing to do with it. As far as I've been able to tell, no one at JPAL has had anything to do with it. And so in some sense, it's all the more exciting because everyone has always talked about uh, system-wide uh, payment reform as the kind of crucial thing that's impossible to do an RCT on. And I always said, no, 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 I, I think we can. Give me a chance. Well, no one gave me a chance. That's fine. But CMMI decided to do it themselves. And this is on, uh, this is on uh, bundled payments for joint replacement. And I was just down at CMS a few weeks ago, and they happened to mention that they, again, like Oregon, on their own, decided to do a randomized evaluation. The, the idea of this bundled payments is they're going to hold hospitals accountable for the quality and cost of their joint replacement procedures, again, sort of owning the patient and their costs beyond just the hospital stay. And they decided to do a two-step uh, randomized model in which they selected 200 metropolitan statistical areas as eligible. They had a high enough volume of joint replacements, et cetera. Uh, they stratified them based on their historic costs. And then they randomly selected 75 of them to get this bundled payments. And the rest uh, are, are the controls. And we'll know, you know, again, as quickly as their primary outcomes can be, can, the time can pass to see them, we'll know what the effect from a randomized evaluation is of something that's a, such a huge topic of, of bundled payment reform. So I think, you know, on that, I'm basically going to stop. I just want to give you, you know, now my crazy optimistic prognosis for the next two years, and, and you guys will make it come true, which is to say what we said two years ago, especially to uh, healthcare practitioners, implementing partners, governments, uh, hospital systems, insurers, the key to the partnership with JPAL Academics is finding a question that the partner wants answered that is amenable uh, to randomized evaluation. And uh, th then we partner with you and work with you to do it in, a, in an efficient and rigorous and inexpensive manner. And that can be every, anything from a patient level, you know, choice of appropriate care like preventive screening, a question of how care is pr provided, such as telemedicine. We just heard a lot about that and how that's taking off. Uh, how to efficiently use existing resources. One thing we've been talking with Dr. Brenner about in addition to his uh, super utilizer intervention is he's concerned about the high rates of vacancies in primary care in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, nobody can get in to see a provider, and the providers have lots of no-shows. How do you do efficient scheduling and staffing? That's basically an operations research question, but they have a bunch of ways to try it out, and they're interested in trying it out via randomized evaluation. And as I said, you can go all the way to insurance contract and reimbursement design or system-wide innovations like payment reform, as CMMI is leading the way on. Um, what we hope to offer, uh, other than our 
blood, sweat, toil, and tears, uh, is a network of academic researchers, many of whom, but not all of whom, are in the room today, who want to partner with practitioners and policymakers on real world problems in healthcare delivery and build the evidence base, especially where there's great uncertainty about what works and why, or whether it will scale up. That's you know, precisely uh, where we want the rubber meets the road, and we want to work with you. We have an amazing staff who can help work with partners to identify opportunities and then match make with researchers um, uh, who are interested. So I'm just going to uh, stop there and uh, ask if people have questions or anything they want to talk about. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm just Dan Gorenstein. I'm just curious. Do you think that this Oregon study that you guys did, which obviously was, it was really influential, it really mattered, do you think it also mattered in the way of inspiring more people to push for RCTs? Did it have that effect at, the, at a research level? That, that's a great question. Um, we sometimes joke at, at j what especially when we're doing reports for funders, we're supposed to talk about our accomplishments and we don't actually randomize our efforts to, to rigorously say what our influence and accomplishments are. Um, I mean, I will say directly it inspired me, right? This is, as, as I said, I saw both the incredible response it got, which I think speaks, as I said, to the power and credibility of randomized evaluations and how rare they were, and it motivated me to ask why and what can you know, an organization you know, in, an, in an academic environment with a capable staff do to try and change that. So I think we're having an impact, but you know, we haven't yet had the randomized evaluation therein. <laughs> Awesome presentation. My question is this. Have you given thought to how you might frame your research findings to get governors and legislatures and secretaries of health to adopt the findings that you all are evidencing? Because as you were alluding to, if you have a finding and if you can't if it's difficult to get governors uh, to drive it, secretaries to drive it, uh, legislatures to mandate it and fund it, then you have awesome findings and some, some, some quick hits, but then how do you sustain the momentum associated with the potential benefits of the research? So that's a fantastic question. I, I think there's a two-part answer. One is a, a slide I skipped over in the interest of time, but I'll take your question as an excuse to discuss, which is, what did we learn from the study? So we didn't learn everything. No one study is going to teach you everything. Uh, there's obvious questions of generalizability to other contexts, and then there are things that you know, we might want to know how a different program would have an effect. But I think you know, relative to those extremes that, that I put up at the beginning, I think we narrowed the realm of permissible discourse, you know, grounded in fact. So those claims that I put up at the beginning that Medicaid is worthless or worse than no insurance, no, that's not true. Our results categorically reject that. We find that Medicaid increases healthcare utilization, including primary care and preventive care. It, imp it increases perceived access to and quality of care. It reduces financial strain and it improves self-reported health. So that's just not a uh, legitimate basis in grounding in fact to be making arguments on going forward. On the other hand, the, the you know, sort of great hopes that this would be a win-win situation in which we would not only cover people with insurance but save money so we wouldn't have to face hard choices that covering the uninsured would get them out of the emergency room, we also reject that. We have this 40% sustained increase in emergency room use, use. And again, the idea that health insurance expansion saves money, um, that's not true at least in the short run, right, where we saw increases in care in the long run you know, as preventive care, et cetera, kicks in, it remains to be seen. So that's one way to answer your question. I think the other thing is we got a lot of, uh, Kate and I got a lot of uh, discussion from, say, state Medicaid directors when these results came out, right, shortly before the Medicaid expansion, saying, you've just shown me that I'm going to have a flood of people in my emergency room uh, when Medicaid is expanded. What should I do about that? How should I design a better system to not do that? And, you know, and our answer was, that's a great question. That's why we need more studies. Tell us what, I mean, and again, as I say, I have no insight into how to make healthcare delivery efficient. I need to talk to the state Medicaid directors, their people, the physicians on the ground, the community organizers, but 
people have lots of great ideas. Tell us what you think are your most exciting and promising ideas that you don't yet have the money or the confidence to implement statewide, and let us partner with you to figure out in real time what's working or not. And so I think the second part of the answer to your question is, that's why, thank God, we have J-PAL and the staff at J-PAL who are far more skilled than I or most of my academic colleagues are to actually talk to people in plain, simple, clear language and explain to them what we've learned, what we haven't learned. So it's not like we always just need a new study. There's some things we can tell you now. But if you have a particular question, do we actually have a good idea of the answer now or do we not? And do we need to partner together to figure that out? And that's, I think, to me, what's very exciting about the work that the JPAL staff do. Um, I have a question building off of actually your last bullet point there. So I work in a similar field as Jeff Brenner, thinking about these high utilizing patients. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in the field is just how long, like literally like years and years, it can take to work with these patients to start changing their behaviors. And I guess I'm a little bit curious as we think about um, the, the time frame for looking at utilization patterns uh, in terms of patients accessing the emergency department once they got Medicaid. Um, I, I guess optimistically I would like to think that there's the potential that as folks have health insurance over the course of several years, there's the potential for them to start building their connections to primary care and having that um, ultimately be their primary source of medical care as opposed to the emergency department. So I guess I'm just curious uh, the, how you think about that, um, looking at behavior change over the long run and if you think there's the potential for RCTs to illuminate any of those trends. That's a great question. So let me give two answers. One is the sort of more narrow answer on, you know, what is the potential for RCTs to study long-run effects? And, you know, the, the simple answer is, well, sure, we can just wait 40 years and I'll tell you the 40-year effects. That, I think, would please no one, and including myself, who's, you know, a, a very sort of narrow-minded academic. Um, but I, one thing is that there have been randomized evaluations done in the past that, again, we're just kind of sitting around, and because of the beauty of administrative data that gets collected anyway, you can then look you know, later. You, so you can go to the past. For example, um, my co-scientific director, uh, Larry Katz, in the early 1990s participated in the Moving to Opportunity experiment, which gave low-income individuals uh, housing vouchers and tracked their progress and, you know, as they moved to better communities. And I think it's fair to say the results uh, from the first you know, five, ten years were, were somewhat disappointing. They weren't showing, they were showing some health benefits, but not a lot of economic benefits. And then you know, that study was done, but the people are where they are, thanks to the housing vouchers. And together with our, our affiliate Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren, they went and looked in administrative data from the, uh, from the tax records at 15 years later, and they found fascinating things that, that the children who were moved when they were very young are having better economic outcomes 15 years later. And that's now inspired them to do further studies on, okay, now that we think they're real long-run benefits, how do we best encourage and get people to take up you know, opportunities to move to better neighborhoods? So one answer is just you can't actually wait or go back and find things that have now become the long run. The, the second answer, though, which is another way to look at it, is sort of to, to ask the question from more of a, a sort of conceptual basis, which is to get to exactly your point that behaviors can be really hard to change and take a long time. So one conversation I had with Dr. Brenner early on is I said, you know, his intervention studies, you know, the right tail of the right tail of the healthcare cost utilizers. People who have been to the hospital more than two times in the last six months, these so-called super utilizers who have, you know, five or more chronic conditions. I mean, they're just very, very sick. And I said, I understand the appeal. These are the 1% you know, of the population who's 30% of the costs, but maybe actually you could have more, maybe it's actually easier to intervene on people before they become high cost. And Dr. Brenner said, and you know, as I said, he has a lot of experience in this area, and I, I don't have any. He said, you know, that's an interesting hypothesis. Like, my sense is we gotta, we, it's, that's like it's too hard to take the whole spectrum of the population who might become high risk and you know, make them not become high risk. I gotta take the guys who've already revealed themselves to be high risk, and that's why we're partnering with him to do this study, which I'm incredibly excited about. But I would love, you know, with the right partner and the right scale, to actually do that same type of you know, intervention at different points in the spectrum 
spectrum and say, like, who is it easier to, to sort of have an impact on? Someone who has yet to become obese and high cost and have many chronic conditions? Uh, we have to reach many more of them because we don't know which of them will become high cost, but maybe we can change their behavior. Or is our money better spent waiting to see who has revealed their high cost and then try and you know, change, change the pattern of care for them? So that's another way I would think about your question. Is, is time up? I'm, I'm getting that time, time is up from my uh, staff who I dare not cross. So I think, uh, uh, one more? Okay, I was told I can do one. from RIP Medical Debt, and we're looking to do a random control trial on debt forgiveness, medical debt forgiveness. And the HIPAA requirements seem to be enormous over, to overcome. <coughs> we're working. Uh, okay. RIP Medical Debt is trying to abolish medical debt, and we're finding that the HIPAA requirements are making it very hard to decide how to how to get the panels to, uh, to work, to find the So you're talking about the HIPAA requirements to actually do your intervention or to do the research on to the To do intervention? the research. Ah, you know, so this is, this, is, um, this is a great question. Um, you know, some of our research managers are here. Uh, the short answer is we work with the partner to figure out a way to, given the existing legal and regulatory structure, most efficiently do the, re do the, inter do the analysis. In some cases, we can sign data use agreements that are approved by all parties such that we can take possession of de-identified no PII information. In other cases, we've worked with partners where we need to actually just write the code and send it in, and they send back the results, but we can't touch the data at all. And this is exactly an area where our staff can be extremely helpful. They both have knowledge and expertise that I don't have, and they have way more patience and real world knowledge than I have to actually translate that into something. Because I, like you, would just throw up my hands and say, there's six regulations, I don't understand it. What's the difference between a limited and a identified data set? That's exactly where our staff can work with you to find the best solution given your particular situation and the governing rules. Great, thank you. Done? All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>